Teach me about the Great Lakes. Teach me about the Great Lakes. Welcome back to Teach Me About the Great Lakes, a twice monthly podcast in which I, a Great Lakes novice, complete novice, ask people who are smarter and harder working than I am, teach me all about the Great Lakes. My name is Stuart Carlton, and I work with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant at Purdue. And I know a lot about different techniques to throw coach pitch softball to, or no baseball, excuse me, to an eight U team. I know about the overhand technique. I know about the sidearm technique. I know about the dart throw. I know about the clock rotation pivot. I know about the kneeling. I know about the standing up. I know about the L bracket. I know about the soft toss. And you know what? I don't know how to throw the darn ball. So it doesn't hit my son when he's practicing. (laughs) And I also don't know a lot about the great lakes. That's the point of this year podcast. Megan, what's up? (laughs) Nothing much, Stuart. I am so happy that you practice so much, and and maybe you won't hit your son during his game. Maybe, yeah, maybe I won't. That's <laughs> the voice. I'm sorry, of Megan Gunn. She is our. Oh gosh, your title. I can never remember it. Megan does awesome work. Aquatic education associate. Aquatic education associate. Uh, we are so glad to have you associated with us, Megan, because you are awesome. <laughs> and my understanding is you were just you. back from the state fair give us one state fair story before we get rolling i will one quick state fair story so when i was growing up the state fair was really just rides and food at nighttime um it wasn't until i was much older that i realized the state fair was about showing animals and grooming animals and all the different animals so that is my state fair story so then the question is one of two things did you see either some i want to know about a weird animal or a gross fried food that's the only thing anybody wants from the state fair is gross fried food or maybe weird animals what you got Ooh, one of the i guess this is my first time at the indiana state fair um and one of their featured fair foods was a bloody mary that has all of the fried fair foods in it and i thought that, that was disgusting yeah that's gross it's got, yeah i won't even it's describing it is disgusting um so that was the grossest uh the fried food bloody mary probably not gonna win a lakey anyway Mm -hmm. (laughs) we got a jam-packed show today we're gonna start off uh i'm back from vacation so i'm full of energy or i was full of energy until i woke up at 3 30 this morning and now it's 3 30 in the afternoon my energy is fading but um uh we got all that stuff scheduled let's just get to it we're gonna start with our brand new um, most popular segment, the Great Lakes News. And so when I was on vacation, I was going to re-record the Great Lakes News intro because it was originally recorded when we had no special Great Lakes News presenter. However, I failed to record, uh, re-record the Great Lakes News intro. So we're going with the old one. Um, here it is. <laughs> And now it's time for the Great Lakes News. Here's your host, Stuart Carlton. Thank you for that, Stuart. It's uh, nice to hear from you. But the true star of Great Lakes News is the one and only Sandra Sobota, who is the program director, I believe, for Great Lakes News. That is right. Today. 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 Yes, that is correct. <laughs> I like the intro music, Stuart. I don't mess with greatness. Well, the music isn't going to change. It's a little weird to introduce myself before introducing you. Um, That's kind of the opposite. It's your show, Stuart. It's your show. It is. It is. Well, we'll see. (laughs) The thing is, I moved my, I used to have my guitar up in my office here. And like, and, and so I'm not going to say this happened during boring Zooms, but there were times during the day when um, uh, I would take little breaks from work. And that's when I would record half of this stuff. But then uh, what happened was sort of the, the the definition of when was an acceptable time started to expand. Uh, anyway, the guitar is now <laughs> down in the basement, um, but it'll be a while before we have any new theme music as a result. Okay, so uh, you are with Great Lakes now. The the best way. What is your theme? Your your uh, slogan? News about the lakes you love. I had it. I had it. News about the lakes you love. And my understanding, my understanding. I'm being told that you've brought us three stories today. Is that correct? I have. I've brought you three different stories, although they're all, you know, a little quirky about the Great Lakes. So science quirkiness seemed like it kind of fit the billing of this podcast. Yep, it sure did. If you, if there were a story about the fried food margarita or no, no, that Bloody Mary, would that be? Anyway, uh, you'll have to bring that one to us. But in the interim, while you're still efforting that, while the beat reporters are out uh, trying to get quotes and what have you, what you got for us? Yeah, so one of the stories we brought you is really a national story, but one of the things I love about this is the lead, as we say in the news business, the first paragraph, first couple paragraphs, the lead about this national story about what's changing with some species is set 
here in the Great Lakes. Um, for those of you who aren't Great Lakes news nerds, uh, you don't know, or really national environment reporting, because John Flusher is a champion reporter with the Associated Press, and he's based in northern Michigan. And so he teamed up with a couple of his colleagues from around the country, Maine, Washington, D.C. They have some other locations in the story. And they looked at what happens, right? Because, Stuart, the ecosystem is complicated. It is. The food web it's is extraordinarily. complicated. It's a complicated <laughs> See, web. See, you've learned that. Yeah. You're, you're learning. There's hope. Um, so they're looking, they're, they're, their feature news story uh, takes examples from their, around the country looking at what happens when a troubled species rebounds thanks to restoration efforts, but it makes things difficult for other species. So the headline here is, as species recover, some threaten others in more dire shape. So what is the lead here? Tell us to us. Yes. Yes. Well, the, the scene setting, the anecdotal lead, as we call it, uh, the reporters go out with biologists um, up in Glen Arbor, Michigan, and they tag the merlins, which prey on the piping plovers. Now, I mean, is there any cuter creature than a piping plover in the Great Lakes? <laughs> That's what I was More just importantly, thinking. they're endangered. Yeah. <laughs> so they're studying, you know, how they can divert the merlins. You know, can they get the merlins to stop eating the adorable endangered plovers? Um, and then they go on with, you know, several other examples of this around the country as seal populations uh, in the northern and North Atlantic uh, grow and recover, what is that doing to the fish populations that they feed on? So an interesting story and a good reminder of the importance of the Great Lakes and, you know, national environmental stories as well. Yep, that's true. Uh, first things first, though, and, and Megan, I see you have a point I encourage you to make in just a minute. This there There is an underlying assumption here that we need to call out, and that is the assumption that birds are real. And we do not make that <laughs> assumption here on the, I'm not saying they're not, but it's not an assumption we make on Teach Me About the Great Lakes. Megan, what you got? So for those that don't know what a merlin is, because I had to look it up really quick, it is another bird that is eating these little cute birds, um, and it's a falcon-type bird. So there but you it's go. cute too, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Look at the picture right there yes. on the top. It's cute. So we have cute on it cute looks violets. It's like an owlish. Yeah. No, it's that cute is not as cute as a plover. Come I didn't on, say it was two. as cute as a plover. What is? Okay. Cotton balls are right. toothpick okay. legs. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um. we pick. <laughs> I mean, we pick what species survive by how cute they are, right? Isn't that science? Isn't that what science that is, is doing? Science. Roughly, uh, yeah. Right. No, you're right. But the Great Lakes, that, that didn't occur to me. So I lived in, in Florida for quite some time. And there everybody loves to talk about the Everglades, of course, is one of these really significant national environmental. And and part of what I'm coming to understand is is that the Great Lakes are just that, right? It's it's a, it's a even more, well, I'm, let's not rank them, but it's also a very important, um, huge environmental uh, uh, symbol and, and resource and things like that. You're putting us on par with the Everglades. Oh my goodness, Stuart! Hi, far of far and above. What do you want? To, uh, yeah, it's, you assume we are I'll not on them. par. Yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. Maybe on par with one Everglade, but there are many Everglades apparently. Yeah. They also talk in there. So I, yes, I agree. But one other thing that caught my eye that I thought was interesting, they talk a little bit about the cormorant, right? Which is uh, an, another bird, and these are actually they will eat fish. And um, I, uh, there was a paper that I read for my dissertation that I, I cited a couple times. Uh, what was the name of the author? Brett, Brett Muter, I believe, and Meredith Gore, and probably someone else. Um, they looked at the evolution of uh, risk, uh, per, risk framing in the media about the cormorant. So DDT in the 60s and 70s, when was the era of DDT? Well, it doesn't matter. DDT uh, really helped to reduce the cormorant population. And so um, when media were covering them, they were covered as what they, as victims, right, of, of environmental ills. Or, and, and since then, cormorants, are, they're now everywhere uh, to the point where when fishers see, anglers see them, um, a lot of times it's bad because they'll eat sport fish. And so uh, now they're covered when risk um, is covered. So it went from risk to cormorants being the media coverage to risk from cormorants being the coverage. Um, and so it's that same thing. It's like a lot of success. And and so it changes our relationship with it. So that's, that's an interesting article. Yeah. And it, it also becomes, you know, what people see, right? Like, I think a lot of times, you know, we in journalism like to do, we like to follow the scientists to the end of the earth. Like, that's great TV for a show. Like, that's, you want the story no one's been to. And it took two weeks to trudge on the tundra to get somewhere. Then there's a species like the cormorant here in the Great Lakes, where anytime you go fishing, I mean, here on the Detroit River, if you get near you get near the range lights, which at the bottom of Lake St. Clair, they tell the freighters where the channel is. 
um, you know, they're nesting in there and it smells and it's full of bird poop and, you know, they're gross. Who wants that? So endangered or not, we don't want gross birds, right? Oh, no. <laughs> not <the good laughs> again, <laughs> again, the, uh, the assumption. But yeah, uh, you know, and so the bottom line, though, this is not usual, right? When you, re when you reintroduce species or you try to uh, save species like with the Merlin, they don't usually end up causing problems, but it, it, it uh, for other species, um, but, but it, it's notable when it happens and, and it ties into issues. It's, it's really complicated. You know, you think about wolf reintroduction, for example, another really complicated issue where it's like the success of that leads to, to other problems uh, as well. Yes. Um, so if you'd like me to transition to the second story, I will sum up this story as unintended consequences, which brings me to the second story, which is about earthquakes in the Great Lakes. So Stuart, mm -hmm. let's have a quiz. Uh, don't look at the article. Okay. Don't peek. I see you. The audience can't see you on the podcast, but I see you looking <laughs> at another screen. How many earthquakes were uh, in Lake Erie at the beginning in the first several months of 2022? I'll be honest. I knew of exactly zero earthquakes because when I moved here, I was happy to escape hurricanes. I did not know to panic about earthquakes. So, uh, but I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess the number I'm going to guess. And I don't remember this from if I'd read the article, 17 million. <laughs> you got it there were 17 million earthquakes in the first six weeks of 20 no there were seven Stuart. seven, seven in the first six weeks That's of 22 week. they were recorded in the, yeah in the eastern basin of lake erie and over 200 have been recorded there since uh the founding of the united states so right who knew i mean there have been a few you feel a few shakes but they're increasing and so when there's a change what do scientists do research Right. They research. Thank you, Megan. Yes. You're welcome. Stuart probably didn't know that. I did um, <laughs> ask for funding. That's what I was going to say. They ask for funding. <laughs> He's one step ahead of us. Uh, yes. So, so they're trying to figure out if it's, you know, again, I like this story very much because who knew, right? Earthquakes, Lake Erie, you don't usually put those two E words together. But, um, you know, is this a is this a situation where because we're studying it, we see more, right? Has technology gotten better and therefore we know about more of the earthquakes? Or are there more earthquakes because of the biggie? Climate change. Climate change. Climate change. Thank you. And water levels. And now you people do know what you're doing on this podcast. <laughs> uh, I no, it's so, everybody yes. but me. Um, that's what you do. You surround yourself with good people. No, that's a that's a good question. And 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 yeah, when there's signal that you can measure that you didn't used to be able to measure, having to contextualize that i think and i'm not a earthquakeologist for example that's not even what they're called i bet um <laughs> it's cooler than what they're what are they seismologists i think an earthquakeologist yes. is anyway my point is this so i don't i don't want to speak for earthquakeologists around the world but um i, I think it's uh, contextualizing that is important yeah yes exactly so um this story kind of gets into some of the research that's going on uh and some of the questions that remain and what next steps are so I like stories that don't have a, you know, particular, and fortunately we get a lot of these in science, right? You don't, you don't have the definitive study, the be all end all, like, yep, this caused that. Scientists hate that, I've noticed. So but this <laughs> is a nice survey of what's going on into earthquakeology, uh, specifically around the Great Lakes. And like I said, who knew we had that many? Uh, Megan, have you been in an earthquake before? I don't know. I like, I kind of want to say yes, maybe, but it was one like we may have been able to feel or couldn't feel. It, okay. I don't know. If you have to I ask. I don't know. Right. You haven't been in a real earthquake. An earthquakeologist would laugh no. at you. Yeah. Okay. Yes, for sure. How about you, Sandra? So yeah. that's funny because technically, yes, but we thought it was a car running into a building across the street. So it was <laughs> a few years ago, you know, here in suburban Detroit, and it was actually one that was centered, you know, further south. So, um, yeah, it did not feel, you know, it was not the same as what you see or funny thing. Reality didn't match. Yeah, exactly. Funny thing. Reality didn't match what you see in popular media sometimes. But yeah, it just kind of felt like a boom or like somebody ran into something nearby. It was a quick one. How about you, Stuart? Now we have to ask you, Megan, let's ask him together. Ready? Stuart? Have you been in a that doesn't work on Zoom. Um, the the dual thing. It does. No. So we'll do it the uh, we'll do it the, the we'll do it the teach me about the Great Lakes way. So you're going to ask me. This always works. This has never okay. not worked. Um, and then uh, then I will answer. We'll do the drum. You will ask me. Then we'll do the drum roll, and then I'll answer. 
and then we'll have uh, uh, well, the appropriate thing after. Okay. So this will be. So good. I'll requeue that without including Megan. Is that what no, you're No, no, include everybody. This this whole oh, deal okay. goes in. Yeah, yeah. No, this is not editing okay. it out. All right. Um, yeah. Or <laughs> I don't know. Whoever wants to ask me, ask me. I guess Megan, we have to ask him the big question. Stuart, have you ever been in an earthquake? No. <laughs> story number three. Oh my goodness. I don't even remember what story number three was. All right. How about this? Stuart, have you ever seen a sturgeon? Megan, ever seen a sturgeon? Yes. Yeah. I used to work with sturgeon. There you go. Megan is the sturgeon Stuart. queen of uh, Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. I too have seen sturgeon, not lake sturgeon, but I have seen other no, not lake sturgeon. Oh, okay. So um, the last story that I bring today is by author John Hardig. He is no stranger to the Great Lakes science policy, environmental restoration world. And he does a monthly column for us at Great Lakes Now called the Great Lakes Moment. And so they're largely centered around restoration efforts in the Detroit River and the Western Lake Erie Basin. And so this month, he brings us Sturgeon for Tomorrow which is just a super cool program. We did a segment on it in the show, uh, which you can also find in the article. Coincidentally, look at that. We put our video content with our news stories. And um, so, I mean, we didn't do stuff like that when I was in school, or I might have become a scientist where you raise the baby sturgeon and you learn your math lessons and your science lessons and your Great Lakes history lessons all through the having this baby sturgeon in your classroom and yes. that was probably a gross simplification of the program no but. no no that's it yeah no baby <laughs> sturgeon i'll be honest cuter than merlin's by far maybe cuter mm-hmm. than adult plovers should they exist i don't know about baby plovers they might be cuter than anyway this is a different oh, story we'll okay. rank these at another point not about ranking not about ranking Oh, right. Well, speaking of not ranking, the, the Lake Sturgeon was a runner-up for the Lakey for Animal of the Year uh, last year, if you recall. It was very controversial. What? Carolyn Carolyn yeah. was very upset, but she also refused <laughs> to join in on the Lakey episode, so she could not uh, put her thumb on the scale. Um, but no, this is this is interesting. So Sturgeon, I mean, they had a rough history, the fish, right? Megan, you may know more about this than I do with Lake Sturgeon, but you know, at first they were slaughtered as nuisance fish, and then there were oh, people were like, wait, but I like caviar, and I like smoked sturgeon, neither of which I've actually had, but, but then they were overfished for that, and and uh, here we are. But but they're a classic long-lived species or a fish. There are a lot of fish where this is a problem where they don't um, re- reach maturity till they're like 8, 10, 12 years old usually, which means that any recovery for them is going to be very long. It's going to take a long time and be very slow to do it. And so what I like about this, and, and so therefore it takes a lot of public support because you don't see immediate feedback um, from the management actions you're taking. And so what I love about this is such a uh, sea granty thing and and that is is that here we are trying to help with that or you know the the surgeon in the classroom is is trying to help garner that public support by introducing people to it yeah and you know there's also we've done segments also in great lakes now about people up north preventing poaching of the sturgeon too so you know i think this is just a great great lake story of classroom efforts to help the restoration efforts um you know there are here in detroit which I talk about all the time because I'm here. But when you, when you go out on Belle Isle, it's a state park in the river and you go out to the eastern end, there's a big placard um, that you can read about because they've put in, like they have in many other places around the Great Lakes, some underwater reefs for the sturgeon to spawn behind. So, you know, like you said, slow process, waiting to see the exact results of everything. But um, the other thing, if I may, something fun about sturgeon is so many places around the Great Lakes where you can pet them as well. So Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. Yes, there's terrible video of me on the internet being a 12-year-old petting the sturgeon. Toledo Zoo, I believe. Also the aquarium in Duluth. And um, the email will come to you about the ones I've missed, Stuart. But, you know, let us know because we'd like to <laughs> we'd like to put them, we'll them all in the show more, notes. Um, yeah. <laughs> more places yeah one of the great all-time uh great lakes area artists is madonna of course she was from um oh gosh i can't remember where i think uh, rochester Minnesota. yeah yeah rochester michigan yeah michigan yeah and she had that song pet a sturgeon it was one of her most popular ones i don't know if you remember Interesting. <laughs> oh the great lakes trivia we we get to so yeah, yeah. yeah so that's what we that's what we brought you this week Stuart. that's good well, got... one more on the sturgeon i better carolyn isn't here i was hoping she would be here to remind me to say this um uh so i don't 
the the one call of teaching about the Great Lakes is we just don't sit there and talk about how great Illinois Indiana Sea Grant is, and so I try not to. Um, it's self evident if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> just how great we are, the exact level. But uh, one of the graduate student scholars that we're funding right now, her name is Brooke. Uh, uh, I actually don't know how to pronounce her last name. I apologize. Brooke, Brooke uh, Karash, maybe, at Ball State. And she's studying um, the role of climate change and learning and memory in embryonic and larval sturgeon. So uh, uh, their embryo stage, they kind of, they, sw- they don't swim, but they bury themselves in rocks. Um, and they're supposed to stay there for a while. But since as the water warms, there's this idea that they might um, sort of mature into larval stage faster and have not learned as many predator avoidance skills as they might otherwise. So that's a concern. And so oh, we're, oh, interesting. Yeah, we're not the dominant funder in our work, but we're contributing. She's one of our scholars, which is one of our great programs. So that will be my once quarterly discussion of cool things that we're doing at Illinois. Oh, uh, yeah. Indiana Secret. Well, you know, I will close out by saying the sturgeon is on your Teach Me About the Great Flakes logo. I have a sticker on one of my water bottles, so I see it all the time. <laughs> and I'm reminded of all the great stories about sturgeon that are out there. Fantastic. Well, for great stories about sturgeon and other great lakes, lakes news that you love, Head on over to Great Lakes Now, period, org, dot org. Follow on Twitter. Where? What other Twitter? Give us all the Twitter feeds. Uh, Twitter is Great Lakes Now, just like the website. Um, and then we're also on Facebook, where you can get updates about all of our events and our watch parties. Um, and we even have some lesson plans around Sturgeon as well. So all on our website. Follow us on the socials. And thanks so much for having me. You are welcome. And we'll take you out with the Great Lakes Now theme song, the wonderful professional sounding theme song composed by the amazing Clint Carpenter. Our guest today is Dr. Nancy Langston. She's a distinguished professor of environmental history at Michigan Technological University up in Houghton and the author of five different books on things ranging from climate history, Great Lakes history, forest and wetland history, and toxics history. Her most recent book is called Climate Ghosts, Migratory Species in the Anthropocene, and you can find a link to that in our show notes. I highly recommend that you check it out. Nancy, how are you today? I'm doing really well, Stuart and Megan. Great to see you. We are so glad that you're here. So you are an environmental historian, right? First of all, what is that exactly? Does that mean you look at the history of the environment or look at people's interactions? What does an environmental historian do, I suppose? Well, I actually trained as an ecologist and wildlife biologist working in Zimbabwe. And I got really interested, not just in trying to you know, address current environmental disasters, but to understand how and why they came about. So I ended up becoming an environmental historian because it let me look at the ecological history, the ways landscapes and wildlife populations have changed, but even more importantly, the way human societies have changed. So for me, environmental history is a tool to understand why environmental degradation has come about, because I really think that gives us better tools for having a more sustainable and just future. I love it. Megan loves it. Um, <laughs> no, I love it too. So, so was it, was that, um, I guess when you sort of transitioned into, so I, 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 I have a different background, but I was at my background in fisheries biology and now I'm a social scientist who studies uh, human dimensions of environmental controversies. And for me, it was sort of results oriented in that I was really interested in these environmental problems. And I, I started to recognize as I worked as a field biologist that many of them are, are people problems at heart. Was it sort of like that for you that, that um, were you interested in trying to solve environmental problems or was it more an intellectual pursuit or what, what led you to that, that changeover? It was very tools focused. I was working in Zimbabwe on carmine bee eaters, which are these spectacular bird with huge tail streamers um, that are long distance migrants across the entire continent of Africa. And this was in the late eighties. And the game reserve where I was working had orders. I always had to have an African guard with me armed with a submachine gun. And they always had orders to shoot any other Black African on site because the assumption was they were rhino poachers. And this was the era of fortress conservation. It was, an, it was completely counterproductive. It was unjust. It was unethical. But it was the tools that conservation biologists at the time thought they had. And I would never learned about land tenure. I was an ecologist. I'd never learned about the history of why 
so many poor urban people were fleeing to these rural enclaves, trying just trying to survive. Um, I never had really learned about the history of colonialism and indigenous dispossession, but I soon realized that to be a better conservation biologist, to do better at protecting wildlife, I needed to understand human relations to wildlife. Um, and I really needed to understand the history of colonialism and dispossession and that kind of settler trauma around the world that has led to so many of our current environmental challenges. That's fascinating. So I've been working on um, this book chapter. Most people have heard me complain about this a few times, and, and we're adding a section. It's um, it's uh, The book is called The Foundations of Conservation Biology, and the idea is we're looking at sort of seminal papers in conservation biology, and I'm working on a human dimensions uh, section with my dissertation advisor. And um, we're adding a section sort of even questioning the idea of conservation and wildlife and biology. And I, I'll be honest, this was not taught to me in grad school, right? and I hadn't thought about it. Um, and, and just this idea that even wildlife and, and conservation in some ways can be thought of as reflections of sort of colonial settlerism, isn't, isn't that right? Yeah, very much so. And that's not to say, I mean, plenty of local communities, indigenous communities, communities around the world had really developed pretty effective conservation strategies because people aren't stupid for thousands of years. They've realized that to persist, they need to figure out some kind of sustainable relationships with wildlife and plants. And different communities have done this in really, really different ways. And I read some of Eleanor Ostrom, the great uh, professor of commons regimes around the world, and her responses to Garrett Hardin's The Tragedy of the Commons, which is, you know, kind of a profoundly problematic view of the world, shall we say, um, that kind of assumes, you know, commons are always free for all resources and non-white people are always going to be destroying everything around them. And Eleanor Ostrom was so brilliant. It was so sad when she died because she really, instead of hypothesizing based, based on grand principles, she looked at the real um, almost ethnographic complexity of how so many different societies around the world have so often figured out really successful common strategies. They aren't free-for-alls. They're really tightly regulated just in ways that co colonial powers often didn't recognize. So one of the great ironies of conservation history around the world is that so often colonial powers came in to a place, completely disrupted the commons regimes because they were tearing apart the societies that had you know coexisted for so many often millennia and so they came in and they saw all this chaos and overuse and they didn't realize it was because they had torn apart the traditional societies um, and so they saw oh the problem is with the societies themselves we have to get rid of their rules and regulations and impose these European ones, not realizing that they were actually the cause of the problem. And this kind of short-term chaos, which was real, was often a byproduct of colonialism. It wasn't some essential state of Africa or South America or the U.S. West. And so conservation is real. People have been trying to do it for a really long time. But kind of European and uh, U.S. American ideas of conservation were often pretty flawed. Yeah, that's interesting. And I'll put some links to some of these papers that I've been reading in the show notes for people to look at if you really feel like digging into it. But but I had I had not given it a lot of thought, I'll be honest. And and um it's yeah, it's worth it's worth thinking about. Um maybe that'll be your next your next book. But but let's let's see if we can shift maybe um into your current book or some of your other books. You've written I think you've written a couple of books that are of interest to our our, our listeners. And and let's start with your your most recent one, which is out in paperback about a year ago, six months ago, something like that. And that's called Climate Ghosts. Tell us a little bit what first of all can you tell us a little bit about what spurred this book and what you're you're looking at with it? Sure. Um, I got interested in writing Climate Ghosts a few years ago when I was finishing up Sustaining Lake Superior, my last book before that. And every day I kayak on Lake Superior. I try and do that, you know, five, six months a year. And I just somehow learned actually a group of people from Michipacatan First Nations up on the Canada side of Lake Superior contacted me and said, hey, Dr. Langston, did you know that the last of the woodland caribou in the Great Lakes is about to be extirpated? And we're trying to save them and we're kind of running into problems with Ontario Ministries. Would you be interested in helping out or learning more? And I said, woodland caribou, caribou, <laughs> Lake Superior? What? I have no idea. 
I had absolutely no idea. Woodland caribou once filled the islands around here, all wow. the places where I kayak. You know, you can go and you can see petroglyphs of ancient caribou and you can learn about that um, ancient peoples followed caribou across the Mackinac Straits, across Lake Huron, that people are here in this region because of their kinship, their relationships with caribou. But I, I really had no idea, one, they were still here, and two, any of that history, that caribou once threaded these islands, these watersheds, these landscapes with their stories and their histories. So they got me really interested in, A, where, you know, did they have any chance of persisting in this region? And how did they get here? How long had they been here? And I was, I've was i always loved loons because everybody loves loons, but it turns <laughs> out for thousands of years, Europeans were terrified of loons. I didn't realize they had a history like everything else. And then Lake Sturgeon is the third of the ghost species. So I got really interested as a former biologist who fell in love with Lake Superior a number of years ago in learning more about these three species on the verge of local extinctions, but still with real possibilities for restoration. So I wanted to know what had happened to them and how could we save them and in the process, maybe save ourselves as well. I have a question. So loons seem like just cute little birds. Why were they afraid of them? Um, that's a great question, Megan. It's always astonishing to me to learn what people used to think in the past, but common loons sound like wolves when they oh. call. And this is where I should play loon calls. They have three different major loon calls. And because they're predatorial birds and because they sing at dawn and dusk like wolves and they <laughs> eat fish, white folks were terrified of them. They saw them as demonic. They saw them as spirits of the dead in lots and lots of cultures because loons have these bright red eyes and can spend much of their lives underwater and are really long distance migrants. Many, many cultures have seen them as um, guides for shaman, guides to other worlds. They've seen them almost as spirits of these liminal spaces, death, um, the passage into death and many cultures recognize death is just part of who we are and so aren't horrified at species that seem to cross those boundaries but Europeans were always freaked out by it so in European culture after European culture there are all these stories of loons battling man at the <laughs> dawn of time it's just like wolves and so when people came when white folks I should say people have been in North America for many many millennia but when European settlers came several hundred years ago, they saw loons as competitors, just like they saw wolves. And so they did their best to exterminate them. They're just cute little birds. That's amazing. They're big birds. I don't know if you've ever had a loon come after you. <laughs> I have not. Are they as big as Canada geese? Because that, that is scary. That's a scary bird. They are slightly smaller than Canada geese, but they're really long distance migrants. And they have these eerie calls. And if you piss off a loon, if you get in the way of their nest sites, then they can be very, very protective. And so then they can be, um, they can kind of put the, a little respect back into <laughs> you and your little boat. All right. And we'll have uh, Quinn, Quinn right here, put in the uh, loon calls and then we'll listen. And then uh, what we'll do, listener, I'll take you behind the scenes. What we're going to do, Megan and I won't make Nancy do this, is we're going to pretend like we're listening live and then we're reacting to how uh, eerie and, and spooky their call is. <laughs> Oh, wow. That is eerie and spooky, isn't it, man? Oh, my gosh. I yeah. would be afraid, too. Actually, actually, <laughs> y'all couldn't hear it, but I was previewing the call. And again, we will put it in. So the viewer, the listeners have already viewed it. Um, but uh, it is uh, it is kind of haunting. And you know, I can see how, like, at dawn or at night, like, uh, uh, yeah, I'm in. I'm in on being terrified of loons. That's fine. I'm very comfortable being terrified of loons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so use this trying to and, and so use this evocative term climate ghosts, but these are species that are still here, right? So so what is, where does the ghost come in? Yeah, ghost species are those that haven't yet gone completely extinct, although they may be what biologists call extirpated, which is kind of a weird word. It means locally extinct from a particular area. But the key idea is that their traces are still present sometimes in DNA, sometimes in small fragmented populations, 
sometimes in lone individuals roaming a desolate landscape in search of a mate. And we can catch glimpses of these ghosts in our memories and dreams and paintings and petroglyphs on rock faces as we paddle through these great lakes that are still incredibly lovely, but are becoming really depauperate, barren of the you know, blooming, buzzing diversity that once filled our watersheds with song and life. And so I'm really interested in what we're willing to do to help recover these ghost species, these species that remind us of the recent past, species that we haven't really yet mourned. Um, and I argue that we shouldn't give up on them. That, you know, once the species gone completely extinct, once people forget about it, it, they lose their special place in human imaginations in our hearts. And restoration takes a lot of heart. It takes a lot of science, but it also takes a lot of love and compassion and feeling of kinship. And so I argue that, you know, ghost species are as much about deciding what we really value, what we really care about, what we're going to do to protect ourselves and our more than human kin in this really warming world. I cannot wait to read this book. <laughs> I can't wait. So what that reminds me of instantly, and I'm, I'm all over the place today, but you seem like you have such a broad perspective. I'm happy to do that. But so that reminds me of the, the um, ivory bill woodpecker right? Which pops up. I don't know if you follow this at all, but I think about ghost species. So this is one that is probably extinct. It's been declared extinct. Although I don't know if you saw this a few months ago, there were these pictures that somebody released, some really well-respected ornithologists that uh, I, I've i looked at them and, and I see what they're saying, but heck if I know. Um, so maybe they still exist <laughs> like in the depths of Arkansas and Louisiana, um, uh, potentially. But but so people are really clinging to those though as a symbol. Do you think, um, you know, but, but I guess you worry that that symbol will be lost and what that means will be lost over, over time. Yeah, I, th I think these symbols um, are really important to people. I mean, sometimes they can become obsessions, of course, but they can also be symbols of hope because if there are still a few, what they used to call Lord Jesus birds, because they're so big, people would go, Lord Jesus, is that a bird? <laughs> um, you know, if there are still some hidden in the, you know, in the remote wetlands, if there's still possibly auroch, you know, wandering parts of of Europe, there seems to be some powerful hope. And there is genetic hope in that case. But I think there's also a sense that um, that we that we can restore hope on this planet if we can actually pay attention to these species that are still parts of our memories and our hearts and our stories. You know, I wrote much of this book during the beginning of the pandemic. I had been a Fulbright Scholar, Canada Research Chair, up in Canada. And in March 2020, at the very beginning, when the pandemic really hit and different countries went into lockdown, we were told to leave all Fulbright scholars around the world. And so I was, I couldn't come back to my house here because we'd rented it out for the sabbatical year to a nurse and what could be more important than a nurse in the beginning of the pandemic. So we were living in the, in the tiny little cabin um, in my background, there was just 10 by 12, no heat, no water, hauling water um, and cutting wood for heat and thinking about what it means to be a ghost, thinking about what it means in our human society when we can't grieve at funerals, when, you know, who becomes a ghost, Derrida, the great you know, problematic uh, cultural theorist, Derrida, wrote some really powerful things about when ghosts began to haunt us. And it's often about unresolved traumas. It's often about not marking this passage, not really, rec you know, marking this journey between life and death, between extinction and a hopeful funeral. So climate ghosts also became a meditation on what it means during a pandemic when so many of these human boundaries or human relationships, I mean, are being severed and really traumatic ways what happens when so many people are dying and yet we're not really able to understand that and grasp that and move on and sometimes literally prevented from yeah attending ceremonies or being at bedsides and, and things there's like no that. closure yeah funerals by zoom zoom is great for lots of things but marking the passage of death and grieving isn't one of them. So I was with a group of women that we were all trying to write and we zoomed every, you know, every couple of weeks about what we were working on. And we ended up talking a lot about 
these kinds of questions, these are all women in conservation. Um, and just trying to think about what we can learn from the pandemic about grieving, about ghosts, about creating a more sustainable and just future for everyone sort of became the heart of this book, as well as a lot of wildlife biology about these three different species and their histories. I mean, I'm, I'm reflecting on, on you're, you're drawing these really big conclusions, right, about the relationship between grieving kind of on the personal scale, but even then on the societal scale for changes that are happening or that might happen. Um, are there sort of some Great Lakes specific things that, that came from climate ghosts, you think? What, what does it tell us about? So you chose these three. And part of that was probably the convenience of this being the place for you and, and the fact that it's, a, you know, it's a meaningful place to you. But what do we know about the Great Lakes kind of specifically um, with regards to these three species? Well, we know a lot about each of the three species individually. And what I was trying to figure out was a puzzle, which is all three of these species have been the focus of restoration efforts for almost a century. I mean, people, conservation biologists, communities have really cared about each of these species, yet each of them remains at risk in northern watersheds. And so I just asked, why? Why are we pouring so much effort for over a century into restoring or conservation rules, protecting these species? And yet, you know, it's not working. And industrial development is part of that, is part of the answer there. But development alone doesn't really answer the question. And so what I found and what I argue is that the historic legacies of indigenous dispossession will continue to constrain the futures for these species if we fail to really examine those legacies. And so what I end up, what I didn't start out thinking I would do this, but Climate Ghost becomes an exploration of different indigenous led restoration efforts around the Great Lakes and indigenous communities from within say the Great Lakes Fish, Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, to the 1854 Treaty Authority, to all sorts of bands on the north, on the what's known as Canada shore. Indigenous efforts at restoration are, I think, incredible opportunities um, for restoring a much more sustainable set of communities. And they're also incredible stories of hope. They're working and they're working in really powerful ways to restore both cultural connections and kinship relations with all these more than human species. So much of the book is about sort of hoping that us white biologists, settler biologists, outsiders will kind of give people the tools they need to really be successful, but kind of step out of the way. In your mind and, and what you're arguing, and I, I'm not saying I disagree, I just want to clear, is, is that even if we if we were to apply the tools of conservation coming from like our very much uh, uh, Eurocentric perspective, and we, we succeeded in the species numbers going up. Um, through whatever way that would that would be in its own way maybe a uh, either a failure or a lost opportunity is that kind of what you're saying in that we have a chance to restore meaning and restore these communities and maybe right some old wrongs like we're the guy in quantum leap or something is that what is that kind of what you're getting at is that fair to say um yeah that's an interesting i'm not familiar with quantum leap so uh, uh, i can't answer that part of it <laughs> fair <enough. laughs> um what i'm saying is that um, these conservation biology tools, which were often developed by settler scientists, are incredibly valuable. And every indigenous scientist I know uses them extensively. But they also use what they call, what we call two-eyed seeing. So combining indigenous knowledge, indigenous perspectives on kinship, on the value of both individual animals within a population and the value of entire communities. Um, and using both those sets of tools and perspectives to come up with a really powerful set of approaches for restoring cultural connections to watersheds and landscape, as well as wildlife and as well as water quality. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. One other theme, and, and uh, we are getting a little short on time, but one other theme I've, I've noticed that I, I want to talk about, because I, I saw this come up in a couple of different contexts, is this idea that... Um, people use sort of pat explanations to avoid making hard decisions. I noticed that in a couple of different ways. One is with climate change and caribou, right? And, and you talk about, you, you said in there that people, you, that uh, because of climate change, people are kind of giving up on caribou. Is that right? Some, some folks are, some wildlife biologists, some agencies are concerned that woodland caribou 
yeah, are doomed by climate change. And so why invest continued resources in a species that's doomed? And I think that's really problematic. I think it, I, you know, caribou adapted to climate change over hundreds of thousands of years. They were one of the few really big mammals that survived the end of the glaciation, the massive warming. They developed relationships with human hunters that allowed both human communities and caribou communities over tens of thousands of years to thrive. Without these caribou partnerships, people couldn't have moved across into the north. Um, and so caribou are super well adapted to hanging out with humans and they're super well adapted to warming climates. They, they dealt with it before. Um, and so my argument is not that caribou won't be affected by climate change, they will be, but the way that caribou and lake sturgeon and common loons have always over evolutionary history adapted to really rapidly changing environments is through migration. And so policy decisions on the part of agencies or ministries or nations that block migration, that, that you know, freeze animals into place are what might doom our wildlife to extinction in the face of climate change. It's not the warming climates themselves. It's having fragmented habitats. It's not allowing animals to migrate or more than human animals to migrate to new environments. And this ties into something that we're talking about um, because we totally have already recorded the Great Lakes News segment. Um, there's something we're talking about in the Great Lakes News segment about how species are, they, they can be much more than just a species, right? When you're thinking about conserving a species, when you conserve a species and take the steps that you need to do to do that, there's a lot more conservation that can and, and has to happen. And in many ways, that's the value of species in the Endangered Species Act, in my opinion, is, is thinking holistically about what do we need to do to create this environment. Well, Sandra, this is really interesting, and, and we only got to one quarter of the things I wanted to get to, so maybe we'll have you back on in a year or so to talk about more stuff, but that's actually not why we invited you here on Teach Me About the Great Lakes this week. The reason we invited you here on Teach Me About the Great Lakes is to ask two questions, but not the normal two questions. Um, the oh, first okay. question is this. I was <laughs> perusing your website, and I saw you have all this art. Tell me about why do you do art, and how does it help your work? That is question number one. I started doing art because a few years ago when I was on sabbatical, I was out in Oregon and I really missed the Great Lakes as wonderful as Eugene, Oregon is. And I realized I needed a hobby besides doom scrolling and obsessing about, you know, it was the impeachment at that moment. But it's just the obsessing only hobby about the news. Doom scrolling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I was hiking all the time and doing all the usual Oregon stuff. But as a kid, I had really loved art. And in high school, we had to choose either a science track or an art track. And I chose the sciences. And it was not, you know, it was completely unfair that you couldn't do both. I agree. It was so frustrating. But anyway, and so I thought, oh, I know, a hobby. Um, but it was more that I had, you know, I absolutely love Lake Superior. I love the Great Lakes. And they are such extraordinarily beautiful landscapes, or watersheds, even in the midst of, the fastest warming lake on earth is Lake Superior right now. It is changing so quickly, so intensely. And yet in the midst of these incredible floods and storms and you know, wave events, it's incredibly beautiful. And so I started going into art as a way of confronting that or really, I don't know, enmeshing myself in these contradictions of this extraordinary yet terrible beauty. And I started by painting a children's book about my then pit bull Vanya on a journey to try and understand Lake Superior's warming and find the source of the caribou and follow the loons. It was just, you know, I have a lot of nieces and nephews. It was to paint a children's book for them. And then I realized um, I was really passionate about using art as a way of exploring tipping points, exploring what climate change means to different groups of people. And now my next project, I'm looking at reindeer around the world and how different groups of people have moved reindeer 30 different times around the world, starting as long ago as the 17th century in Iceland. So I just get back from Iceland, hanging out with these reindeer herds, um, or trying to, we couldn't actually find them, but that's okay. <laughs> but, but I just decided that painting is a great way of exploring these human, more than human relationships in these extraordinarily beautiful, but rapidly changing watersheds. So can you tell us, that I think that's fascinating. I went to Iceland last summer and we also didn't see any reindeer, um, but we tried to find every animal that we could. Reindeer are the brood 10 of uh, Iceland things, apparently. 
Yes. Um, but what is a special place in the Great Lakes that you'd like to share with our audience and what makes it special? Well, Lake Superior is the most special of all the Great Lakes, all of which are really <laughs> special because it's the biggest lake in the world, biggest freshwater lake in the world. It's most rapidly changing and it is so extraordinarily beautiful. And people think it's so incredibly beautiful and clean and pristine because it's untouched. But what's really special about it is it's so incredibly beautiful and in such relatively good health, not because it's untouched, but because over the past century, different communities came together across class boundaries, across racial boundaries, across national boundaries, indigenous with settler communities to protect and restore the lake. So it's an incredible story of restoration. And it's also just unbelievably beautiful. So the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore, which you can't see me, but is behind me in a picture, <laughs> is one of the most beautiful places on earth. And also the Keweena Peninsula, where I live now, is if anyone has a, has a chance to go all the way up to the top of the Great Lakes and explore the Keweena Peninsula on Lake Superior, you should definitely take that chance. Sounds like we need a road trip. Yep, we sure do. <laughs> Dr. Nancy Langston, now that you've made everybody jealous of where you live and <laughs> want to come visit you, thank you so much for coming on and teaching us all about the Great Lakes. That was a fascinating interview, and, and I, I really love the connections that she... Um, that, that Nancy makes between sort of the environment, but also people's relation to it. And it's something I've been thinking a lot about. So I was really glad to get to talk to her about that. Me too. And just like thinking about how, like the people that lived in this area for so long, like how they interacted with the environment and how there are things that we can learn from that. Yep. And that's a conversation actually we hope to continue to have where we've got some stuff planned for later in this year, maybe early next year, where we're going to bring on a, a, a series of people, um, champions of just that kind of uh, thought and work. So I, I'm excited to get that going, but but we'll see. Um, and it ties right into the stuff I've been thinking about with uh, uh, the idea of wilderness and the frontier, because these are really foundational things to like my worldview. And so it's it's uh, to hear, you know, uh, to expand your thinking on that, I think is is really important and really interesting to do. Anyway, as always, a lot of fascinating people. Uh, cool. Well, you have anything cool going on, Megan? What do we do you want to tell people about? School is starting. So I had a very busy summer with the world opened up. So I like was in classrooms and taking students out to the to Lake Michigan and all that fun jazz. And it's about to pick up here again. And I've got a fun three day field trip for, with one of our teachers to take our students to Lake Michigan to learn all about Lake Michigan, just that hands on learning. Um, and just bits and pieces of that all semester. So that is what I'm really, really looking forward to. That is awesome. Teach Me About the Great Lakes is brought to you by the fine people at Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. We encourage you to check out the great work we do at iicgrant.org and at ILINC Grant on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media. Teach Me About the Great Lakes is produced by Hope Charters, Carolyn Foley, Megan Gunn, and Rini Miles. Ethan Chitty is our associate producer and fixer. Our super fun podcast artwork is by Joel Davenport. The show is edited by the awesome Quinn Rose, and I encourage you to check out her work at aspiringrobot.com. If you have a question or comment about the show, please email it to teachmeaboutthegreatlakes at gmail.com or leave a message on our hotline at 765-496-IISG. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Teach Great Lakes. Thanks for listening and keep grading those lakes. And you didn't ask about the diversity project. Stuart, I didn't, which is cool. No, I'm I'm disappointed that I didn't get to it. I did not want to pull it, but I feel like we have raised and I want to I want to find out about it. I do, because yeah, that book chapter. So the problem we're having with these seminal papers is that all the semi, I all the seminal papers are written by white old white dudes, right? Most of them dead. <laughs> the term itself might be a bit of a hint. <laughs> Maybe try the term core papers. Anyway, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know. Well, I, I didn't. I got brought. Actually, we thought this book was going to be published in two thousand and eight. That's when I first put it on oh, my CV. Okay, Eleanor Ostrom's written amazing work. Yes. Anyway, um, yeah. Well, the, they had a time 
constraint uh, on when the papers had to be come from. And so that's fine. But so then in between 2008 and now, there's been a lot of thinking, right? And yeah, so I spend half of the paper uh, or the chapter uh, using, uh, well, not half, but I, I spent a significant portion of the chapter using uh, Garrett Hardin's own viewpoints to uh, roast himself. Because it turns out when you write a lot of papers about white nationalism and, and how, <laughs> based on a what I would call an overly simplified uh, thought exercise that became the thing you're defined by, um, it, it can lead to problems. But anyway, and, and so I've been thinking a lot about that. And then, and then when we got on the call, it was like I was – it was me and I was the youngest person, the youngest author, I think, in the whole group. And I'm not that young. Um, and, uh, it was a bunch of other old white dudes and in my advisor, who was a woman. And, and I was like, this is like the literal personification of this gatekeeper problem. Right. I was like, this is it. It's happening. Uh, I can see it on zoom. I guess the question is that it's how do you respect the, um, the foundations? That's what this book is called. The foundations, which are important. Right. But also recognize that there's some deep flaws in there. And, and sometimes it's, uh, flaws because of who people are. Um, and, and uh, you know, what their views were. And sometimes it's flaws because of who was not invited uh, to the table or wasn't even thought of being worthy of being invited to the table. And I don't, I don't, I'm just like thinking through how to try to balance that stuff. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> um, you know, part, part of the reason we put together this syllabus project was a number of years ago, there's a Twitter conversation about people putting together syllabi in environmental history. And these were grad students or young faculty. It's like, oh, I've got 10 minutes to put together a syllabus for a class I have to teach in the fall. And so there were lists of, you know, names to include, and they were all white men. And a group of us got pretty frustrating because the prize winning books in environmental history have been mostly by women and scholars of color. The, the publication list, the, there's no reason to keep keep replicating it's that people are crushed they're under time pressures and you know these aren't bad people just sort of regenerating what they read in grad school um but they're just stressed and time stressed so we thought rather than just give people a hard time about it which we did in part um we would also provide a zotero library with i think now it's over 850 maybe 900 wow. sources by divorce scholars all categorized and tabbed and collated and, you know, I pulled together some data by searching and found, you know, 87% of syllabi don't even have a work by a diverse scholar. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it, it's so out of balance with what's being published in the field. And it's partly because what you, what you suggested, people feel like they have to, you know, provide students with the grades. Um, but the greats were all white men and they're all my friends, but you know, that was who went to grad school 40 years ago. And so our argument is we don't have to reproduce the greats. We can move beyond that. All of the people on, on this call that I was talking about are great people in there. And many of them I know personally are very nice, of course, but I just meant it was like literally just what you're talking about. It's, it's such a, yeah, exactly. A exactly. And often I think it's just a time crunch problem. So we tried to make it easier for people by providing them with easy to find sources they could download. And sometimes it's that people need to be shamed. I mean, we all went back and looked at our own syllabi and we were reproducing the problem too. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it, it's hard though. It's hard to, to sort of move beyond these ideas of what defines core greatness, seminality, whatever in a field and realize that we just really need to open up our ideas about what conservation is and how African-American, Indigenous American, Latin American communities have been doing conservation and writing about it in really powerful ways and, and doing like demonstrations, working with landscapes for so many millennia. Yeah. And that's why we started, we put in this extra section and because of the constraints of the thing, it's only if it's three paragraphs or something, but it's just saying, now, hold on. Let's, oh, three let's, paragraphs. Let's, let's, it's, it's, only 300 pages. No, 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 no. <laughs> this whole thing is, it's right, right, right. It's 20 papers. And we're supposed to have two, two paragraphs or so on each paper. And so then we threw in stuff at the end saying, but, and then the point we make is like, if we can't do this in our field, then there's no hope. Right. And, and, and so of course we can do it. And, and so we're, I'm, yeah. And then we have to be careful not to editorialize. So, so the secret is editorializing kind of between the, it's kind of the secret to working for a program like Seagrant is um, choosing what oh, to focus right. the spotlight on is the key. Right, right, right. 
Well, I had something similar happen years ago. I was asked to write an article for Encyclopedia of Forestry about women in forestry, great women in forestry. And the editor, whose name will go unmentioned at the moment, said, oh, you won't need more than a few paragraphs, right? Because there haven't been any important women in forestry. <laughs> and so I was like, OK. So I, you know, it gave me a task. And it turns out in India in particular and in Africa, there have been, you know, for hundreds of years, you know, the foundations of global forestry were, you know, carved out, created by women from India. So, so I got to, in the process of getting pissed off at that editor, I, <laughs> I learned so much for myself about, you know, how rich the origins of forestry were around the world. Yeah, it's been, it's been good for me to do that too. Yeah, and that's great. And we see changes. When I was hired as a faculty uh, professor, in 97, I was the first woman at, at, um, that ever had in the department as a tenure track faculty. And now more than half their PhDs that are graduating are women or are scholars from diverse backgrounds, often from India. Um, and so the, you know, the, the profession is really transforming itself, which is wonderful to see. 